visiting most days, and uh, she's, she's doing a little better today than she was yesterday, and uh, keep, keep praying for her. She's in 1F, uh, it's the first floor at the back of the hospital there, and I can't remember what room now, I just go to room four, yeah, okay. Um, Anyway, if you're able to, to visit, I'm, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. She seems to be, be better in the afternoons than the mornings. So uh, if, you, if you visit, probably better in the afternoon or evening. Um, we're, we're looking in 2 Corinthians tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And just to mention a, a few things by way of, of review, uh, 2 Corinthians has a lot to do with the Apostle Paul's ministry and apostleship. He spends a lot of time uh, dealing with that. And in 2 Corinthians are some great verses that uh, are a real blessing. There are some real famous ones. Uh, one that's a blessing to me is, is chapter 1, verse 4, talking about how God who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God comforts us, and we can be a blessing in pointing others to that same comfort. Or uh, chapter 2, verse 14. I like this one. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. Or uh, chapter 3, 18. Here's a famous one. Beho uh, but we all with open glass... Ah, can't read. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we look to Jesus, He helps us to become more like Him. Uh, chapter 4, verse 16, For the which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Probably the most famous one is uh, 2 Corinthians, well, no, this is not it. Chapter, chapter 5, verse 17, there it is. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, most people know that verse. don't even necessarily know where, it, where it's found. And then one of, the, one of the reasons I say that is we're going to be looking at a verse tonight that's like that. It's just a real classic that most people know, even though they don't always know where it's found. Now, chapters 10, 11, and 12, 13 are, are basically Paul defending his apostleship. And that sounds kind of odd in a way, but the importance is that uh, he was an apostle, and God used him to write much of the New Testament, and so it's important that he, uh, that uh, the Corinthians and then us and uh, people in general recognize that this was a man who God had called and God used, and God spoke through him, uh, even to us today. Uh, in chapter 10, he took, it talks about Paul's authenticity. You know, he was he wasn't living for himself. He was following Jesus' example. He was using spiritual weapons. Uh, he was uh, looking to God's standard, and uh, he was looking for God's commendation. He wasn't worried about what people thought. He was, he was concerned what God thought. Uh, chapter 11 talked about his, mo his motives. Um, the first verse talks, uh, first couple verses talk about his jealousy over them. And we talked about how you know, jealousy can be a good thing. And jealousy can be a godly thing. And he wanted them to, to live for the Lord. He was generous to them. He suffered for them. And in that chapter, it goes through a lot of the areas where Paul, you know, risked his life uh, for the ministry and, and for people. Well, then in chapter 12, we're, we're looking at some of the proofs of, uh, of Paul's apostleship. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, his revelations from Christ. That's, a, that's an amazing thing, you know, what God had... Uh, shown and uh, said to Paul. We're going to look at his thorn in the flesh, his apostolic signs, and his courage to deal with sin. So, let's, uh, let's read chapter 12, verses 1 through 6 to start. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet 
Of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. We're just going to stop reading there for the moment. Uh, Paul believed that he saw heaven. And you can see from the way he says it there, he wasn't sure if he actually went to heaven or just had a vision of, of heaven. Uh, some, most people believe this is uh, the incident that happened in Acts chapter 14 in Lystra when Paul was stoned and uh, they thought he was dead. They, drug his, they thought his dead body out of town and the disciples were standing around looking at him and he stood up and said, let's go to the next town, <laughs> I guess. You know. um, amazing thing. Now, whether it was a vision or whether it was real, uh, this is, as far as I know, the only time he mentions it. And this is over 14 years later. Um, he didn't write a, a fantastic book about it. He didn't make a movie. He didn't take a tour, How I Went to Heaven and Came Back. Uh, he just mentions, and he mentions it in uh, typical of that kind of uh, part of the country and, and that time. He talks about it in the third person. He doesn't even say I, you know. You know there was a man. Uh, you know, he could have bragged about it, but bragging would bring glory to Paul. That's the way people deal with things today. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't think people that write and talk about it today have actually experienced it, unless it was demonic. But um, Paul... Paul is telling us the truth here. And what he glories in, is, he says, is his infirmities. Did you notice that in verse 5? <coughs> of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Uh, in, infirmities has to do with lack of strength. Yeah, most of us glory in our strength. He said, I'll glory where I'm, where I'm weak. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a different attitude uh, toward life when... when Paul reached, reached that point. He was just looking for whatever the Lord had for him. And you know, Peter had a, a little bit similar uh, experience. Not exactly the same, but in Matthew 17, it talks about how that they saw the Lord transfigured. It's hard to, uh, to know what, what exactly it was, but uh, the Bible says his, his face did shine and his raiment was white as the light. He, he glowed. And then God spoke from heaven. Peter talks about that in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. He, he mentions exactly that situation. He, he prefaces it by saying, we've not followed cunningly devised fables. He said, we were eyewitnesses. And he talks about that. Um, we, we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. He said, we had an amazing experience. But the next verse says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And he's talking about the Scriptures. Holy men of God wrote the Scriptures. You know, we've not been shortchanged when it comes to knowing the truth. Don't think that walking with Jesus or having Jesus stand at the end of your bed or hearing a voice from heaven would give you more than what you have in God's Word. In fact, we, we, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. You know, with Jesus, can you imagine being in a big crowd on a hill with Jesus speaking? You might, you might have to say, well, what did he say? What was that last bit? Not with the Bible. You can, you, can, you can read it. It's written down. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And that's what Paul was doing as well. He was saying, you know, I had this experience, but that's not the key. Experience is not the key. Our, our trust is not in our senses. Our trust is in God. Our senses can be very wrong. God deserves the glory, not us. And uh, this has to do with, uh, with Paul's apostleship. Uh, God spoke to him. God gave Scripture through Paul. Uh, so we see, first of all, Paul honored. But then as the chapter continues on, we see Paul afflicted. Look at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, 
in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Uh, you know, Paul says, uh, so that he wouldn't be proud, God allowed a, a trying, difficult, very obvious affliction. Now, Paul did the normal thing. He asked that it be removed. I mean, that's, you and I would do the same. And when it wasn't, he gloried in it. That's an amazing thing. We can learn something here tonight. <laughs> when it wasn't removed, you know, he asked him. Evidently, it was such a serious thing that he could, he could count the times. <laughs> Ask the Lord three times um, to take it away. And his, God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, what I want to ask you to think about here is, how do you deal with affliction? I mean, we're all going to have affliction uh, for whatever reason. Um, some people get bitter. I've met plenty of people who you know, they had some problem. And, and listen, problems are relative, aren't they? Sometimes you can think you have a problem until you meet somebody who has a real problem. <laughs> you, know? you, can, you can worry about a bump on your finger until you see somebody who doesn't have a finger. You know? um, we can get bitter. We can give up. I've seen people do that. Oh, yeah, I used to be a Christian and whatever. Uh, some people just endure, and they let you know they're enduring. We had a lady. I, I had to laugh. I mean, every January, she would mope around until you asked her, oh, what's wrong? And then she'd tell you what was wrong. You know, January, oh, that was a bad month. Bad things had happened in January. Um, you know, affliction's going to come. We can deal with it in different ways. We can thank God for it and serve Him with it. That's what he's saying there at the end of verse 9. Now, mine's a red letter edition, uh, so he gives the part of the Lord's answer, and then Paul's response is, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And like I mentioned, that word infirmity means lack of strength. All glory in my lack of strength, or you could just even say my lack, because God will get the glory. God will have to supply the strength. You know, there's, there's times in your life when you won't be sure whether it was you doing it or the Lord doing it. But when you have no strength, you know the Lord did it. <laughs> and Paul was able to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glory in, in my infirmities. And a couple of things I noticed there is, one, God didn't take away the affliction. You know, Paul asked him to, God didn't do that. Sometimes God says no. But God used it to strengthen Paul's faith. Uh, I shared this, these verses with uh, Nick and June this week. You know, I was preparing this sermon and speaking to her, I think it was yesterday. I said, you know, I came across this verse. I think it would be a blessing to you. My grace is sufficient. Just talk to him about it a little bit. Uh, you know, there's plenty of people going through real affliction. And we are too, many. God didn't take away the affliction, but he did use it for, for faith. As well, he didn't really explain. Now, verse 7 is a little bit of an explanation uh, so that he wouldn't be, wouldn't be proud. But he did give a promise. And you know, that's what we need to look for from the Lord. Uh, we don't always need an explanation. We don't always need a change. But we do need God's promises. That's our hope. That's, that's our strength. Uh, my grace is sufficient. You know, that's true no matter what you're facing. That's true for you tonight. It's true for, for June. It's, it's true for families. I've been at the hospital a lot lately. And, you know, you walk past doors and you see people that look so sick. And you think of all the heartache going up. I mean, that's a big place. There's a lot of heartache in the world. But God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for them. If they would know it, if they, some of them would. Some of them wouldn't. Some of them would have no hope. But God could give them hope. My grace is sufficient. Paul gloried in his infirmity. You might say his infirmity, his, his problem became a beauty mark. You, know, you can have things that the world might say, ooh, you know, what's, what's that? Oh, that's, that's my beauty mark. You know? <laughs> I, I've heard, I don't remember what, I don't know what years it was, 100 years ago or so, when people used to fence, you know, sword play in, in Europe. It was a mark of manliness for a guy to have a scar on his face. <coughs> Man, that meant he was a fencer, you know, <coughs> big whack there or whatever. Um, you yeah, know, it, it, was, it was something they gloried in. And that's what God is saying here about the difficulties that we face. Don't give up. Don't just endure. Don't get bitter. 
Glory in it. Let the Lord do something good with it. Yeah, I know several people whose ministry is based on an affliction they went through. My brother is one of them. His wife died over several years, finally went to heaven, and he realized that people didn't understand grief. So he studied grief, and he looked at grief, and he tries to help people. He has a ministry helping people to understand grief and how to deal with it. Uh, you know, that's it's not the kind of ministry you pray for, but uh, we just take what God gives us, and we, and we can use it. You see, God, uh, Paul knew that God was working through his situation, and he knew that God was getting the glory. You know, we've, we've looked at how God honored Paul, We've seen how God allowed affliction. I think Paul's affliction was kind of like Job, where God allowed Satan to, to do something. Uh, and you know, both honor and affliction will show what your faith is. Uh, there's many a person who's fallen because things, they've been honored, because things have gone really well. There's been many a person who's fallen because of affliction. Both of those, the good and the bad, will show your faith. You know, where you are in your walk with the Lord. Let me ask you, have you found God's grace sufficient? You can. It is. Bad things can work for good. Weakness can be a gift from God because then we have to say, Lord, you take it from here. You take me from here. Paul's success in serving the Lord in spite of his afflictions is part of his apostleship. God wasn't relying on Paul's strength. God was working through him. His call is of God, not his natural ability, but his, uh, the Spirit-filled work. And then he goes on, and, and really it talks about Paul's consecration, I guess you might say. Uh, verse 11, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Uh, Paul had done right. Yeah, he, he was the one who would brought the gospel to them. And he should have been commended by them. Uh, he'd done great and godly works among them. It talks about the signs of an apostle there in, in verse 12. It's interesting, it starts with patience. <laughs> I never thought of that as a sign of an apostle, but uh, I, I guess it is. And he, he did things that were obviously of the Lord. Basically, apostles could do everything the Lord could do. I, I was thinking about it today. I guess the only thing I've never heard them doing is walking on water. <laughs> they didn't do it. They raised people from the dead. They healed the sick and, and so on. Uh, he, they'd seen that in him. That shouldn't have been a... It shouldn't have been a problem that they could say, yeah, this is of God. And he'd not been a burden to them. In, in verse 13, he says, For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children not, not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He's saying there, I'm not after what you have. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to, to give. I'm here for you. Uh, he'd not been a, a burden to them. He'd been a blessing. And let me tell you, a true servant of God cannot love money. It, it, the, the two just don't go together. Uh, he wasn't using them. He was serving them. And uh, they should have been able to work together. And I know they did at some points. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 1, he said, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Uh, they should have been working with him, not, not opposing him. Uh, they should have appreciated him. You know, gratefulness is a part of godliness, isn't it? And uh, sometimes we need to stop and think. Uh, we've got a lot to be grateful for. Go to verse 15 as he continues. He says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. So the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Uh, sometimes you feel like that as a parent, don't you? you know, you're doing the parent thing, and boy, they don't always like that, but someday they'll appreciate it. But be it so, I, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. <laughs> did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. 
Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? He said, even when I was away from you, you know, the people I sent, they were the same. They weren't trying to get things from you. They were, they were there to help you. They were there to be a, a, a blessing. He led them to Christ. He ministered to them even when he was absent. Uh, verse 19, again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. You see, what I've been doing, what I've been, uh, the, the ministry that I've had is, is to build you up, uh, to help you. And uh, the very ones that should have commended him and encouraged him the, were the ones that here he's defending himself to. Paul had done right. And in the last couple of verses, he promises him that he'll continue to do right. <laughs> Uh, look at verses 20 and 21. These are kind of hard verses. He says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and that have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they've committed. He's saying, uh, when he comes, he'll deal with the problems. He has the right and the responsibility to do that as an apostleship. And he's, he's telling them, not in his own strength, but in God's strength. See, one of the criticisms they had of him was, oh, he writes a strong letter, but boy, when he, when he comes, he, he's not going to be that strong. And what he's telling them is, that when I come up, I'll, I'll be as strong as the, as the Lord needs me, me, me to be. He would deal with sin. And they should have been consecrated to the Lord. Instead, they were more consecrated to self. And he warned them, if they didn't deal with sin, he would. It's quite a list he gives there. Verse 20, a lot of these things are things that society accepts as normal. You, you, you know, you see homes where people, people treat each other abominably and they just think it's normal. And that's the way the world is. I have a little note written in my Bible, just my own writing. Corinth was a vile city that caused the Christians to look lightly on sin. You know, sometimes when, when the world around you is so wicked, you, you kind of lower your standards even as a Christian. And that, that happened sometimes in, in Corinth. And he was warning them, uh, you know, debate, that doesn't sound bad, you know, arguing. Well, God says that's, that's not the way we're to be. Envying, wrath, strife as factions. It, you know, the world thinks it's normal. You've watched Parliament lately? Man, it's, it's, it almost makes you give up hope. You know, sort of, all they do is, is have strifes. It should tell us something when the other group is called the opposition. I mean, what are they going to do? But... Uh, yeah, in a church, that's not the way we're to be. Backbitings. Uh, in Peter, that's translated evil speaking. You know, talking bad about people. Whisperings. You know, talking in secret about people. Swellings has to do with pride. and Tumults. Tumults has to do with confusion. In, in a lot of groups, a lot of Christian groups, there's confusion. Uh, there's no um, constant uh, beliefs and, and, and uh, actions. Listen, God is never the author of confusion. Like we read, like I read earlier in 6.1, we're to be workers together with Him. We're not to receive the grace of, of God in vain. And that's what Paul is saying to them. Uh, th this is not a carnal thing we're doing. This is a spiritual thing. And uh, proof of, part of the proof of Paul's apostleship was his willingness to deal with sin. He was in it for God's glory. He talks about sexual sin there as well and in verse 21, a very, it's almost hard to imagine how wicked some of these places were. Uh, but you know, the Bible condemns these things. Uh, real Bible preachers will condemn these things. Terrible list, 20 and 21 there. Why? Because they tear down. Listen, anybody can tear down. Um, one of our young men talked about his dream job. Listen, my dream job would be in demolition. Man, I could tear down anything. You give me a stick of dynamite, it'll, it'll be gone, you know. Anybody could do that. But it takes skill to build things, you know, put something up and have it stay up. 
Uh, God wants us to build. At the end of verse 19, Paul said, uh, We do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. I'm not doing this to tear you down. I'm doing this to build you up. You know, sometimes a child doesn't understand that about a parent. No, you can't do that, son. No, son, I'm going to have to spank you for that. Daughter, whatever. You know, they think, oh, they just, they just don't like me. They just don't want to. No, they, they have your best at heart. That's what, what Paul is saying about them. That's what God says about us. Uh, there's things that, uh, that God uh, says we need to put off. There's things he says we need to put on. And uh, I'd like you to apply this to your own life. I'd like you to spend some time thinking about this today. Uh, are you uh, building up or are you tearing down? And apply it to your own life. Apply it to your family. In your family, uh, are you a blessing or a burden? I mean, really. Uh, I think a good way to look at it is, are you a stepping stone or are you a stumbling block? Stepping stone and a stumbling block. They're both rocks. But one is, is for a good purpose and the other one's in the way. Uh, to your family, are, are you a blessing? Are you a, are you a help? In your words, your actions, your attitudes. You know, some people, it's like a, they come in and a dark cloud comes in with them. And we don't need that. We need the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Man, there's no law against those. If there was, we'd, we'd want them. <laughs> yeah. well, we need to, to be careful of what we're doing with, with our life. To your church, are you a stepping stone or a stumbling block? You know, as a pastor, I've been a pastor a long time now, and you, know, you begin to see patterns. And, and you, you find that some of the folks you spend the most time with and you put the most heart in are, are the folks that just walk away and, and never, never say thank you. Someone related it to the difference between planting a stick and planting a plant. <laughs> Listen, you can plant a stick and you can build up around it, and eventually it's going to rot and fall over. You put a plant in the ground and water it a little bit, and it'll grow. That's the way we're supposed to be as Christians. We need to grow in the, in the grace of the Lord. Uh, when we do wrong, uh, when we're a stumbling block, we should be ashamed and repent. There's a, there's a place for shame as Christians, but not to hang on to it. Uh, I, I quoted or I read to you this morning from uh, Jeremiah. It's interesting, I've, I've got a, a verse from the same chapter, actually. Jeremiah chapter 6 and uh, verse 15 he says, were they ashamed when they'd committed abomination? Talking about Israel. Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. Yet when we do wrong, we should be ashamed. Now, the very next verse is where he says, stand in the way. Ask for the old paths where, the, where there's the good way in, and walk therein. We need to find God's way. We need to be stepping stones. It's like uh, the psalmist wrote, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Uh, we need to get past these, these things that are tearing us and others around us down. And that's what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth there. Uh, he's saying, listen, uh, you think I'm weak? Uh, we'll see how weak I am when, when I come. Uh, we'll deal with these things. Uh, I'll give you a little taste of, of chapter 13. He says in verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. What he's saying is, you need to be ready. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He's saying, we'll deal with it scripturally. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. He said, you think I'm too weak? He said, you'll see when I come. Uh, he's warning them, I'm coming. You need to, you need to sort these things out. Uh, you know, his, his apostleship gave him not only the right, but the responsibility to do that. Now, he's warning them that he's coming. How much more we should be ready for Christ's coming? You know, uh, we don't have to wait for an apostle to come, uh, but Jesus is coming. And we need to live our lives in such a way that if he came today, we'd be ready. First John, he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know, what a pity it would be 
uh, to be ashamed when Jesus comes. Are you ready for his coming? Is God's, have you been believing that God's grace is sufficient for your need? It is. And it'll help you if you'll believe that. We're going to take our, our song books and go to the, to the song, I Need Thee Every Hour. It's page 118 in, in your hymnal there.